confidence and self-belief, very important in Formula One. But the epitome of that is when a driver, having just got the pole, comes in and apologizes for his lap. Lando Norris did exactly that at Monza. The implication is that he didn't think he'd got the pole. I think he knew he'd got the pole. And even if Lando hadn't gone quicker on that last lap in Q3, he still would have beaten his teammate Oscar Piastri and taken the pole. As it was, he did go slightly quicker. It was a bit of a messy lap in terms of the first chicane and the last sector going into the parabolica. But it was the quickest lap of the day because of what he did in sector two, going in specifically to the first Lesmo, a dramatic corner, not only by Monza standards, but by Formula One World Championship standards, if you look at the range of circuits we have on the Grand Prix calendar these days. Absolutely superb driving by Lando Norris. What he would have felt, I think, going into that first Lesmo corner, very quick corner on his last run, was, I want to go quicker, and I've just messed up the first chicane, I've messed up the exit, or whatever it was. Something wasn't right at the first chicane, maybe braked a fraction too late. He knew he hadn't done a very good job in sector one, so he had to make it up going into the first Lesmo. And you can do that, I suppose, by thinking, I'm going to break even later and get the power on sooner, do this, do that. Lando didn't. Lando does what, well, what I talked about at Silverstone in the wet, what I talked about at Zandvoort. Lando did one of these wonderful things. He's, it's become his trademark now, where he comes out of the brakes and the throttle at moments when other drivers are on a little bit of throttle or a little bit of brake. Lando is just letting the car settle at higher speed with no brakes or throttle. Just letting the car settle, carrying that speed when he has no load on the car front to rear. Absolutely beautiful to watch. I'm sure many great drivers over the course of the history of Formula One have done the same thing and have found the same thing. I remember talking to Sterling Moss about that, about that feeling. He was talking about it in the wet, about how... It's a wonderful feeling to come out of the brakes and throttle and let the car settle when you feel as if you're absolutely on the limit of adhesion. But because you've got no load front to rear, the tyres are working just that little bit better. And I think that's what Lando did. I mean, amazing to me that a driver who's looking to go quicker through a corner like the first Lesmo, very quick six-gear corner, fifth six-gear corner, doesn't fall into the trap of just trying to go in a bit too deep or break a little bit too hard a bit later or get the power on a bit sooner and live with some sort of oversteer moment. He does it by just coming out of all the, coming out of the pedals and letting the car do the work for him. Absolutely brilliant, lovely to watch. And that's where he found it. The second Lesmo is about the same as he had been on the first lap. And in terms of his exit speed from the second Lesmo, which is a tighter corner now than it used to be in the John Watson crashing the MP4 one days, much tighter corner. Uh, there's not much you can do now in, sec in, in the second Lesmo. Yeah, it's a dramatic corner and you can run wide and all those things. But in terms of make up t making up time, it's just a corner where you don't want to make mistakes. You just want to use all the road. And as, they came as he came down the straight after the second Lesmo, he's about the same speed as he had been on the previous lap. It was, so it was all in that first Lesmo and just wonderful to watch and a very unusual place, I think, to pick up time the way Lando did. Sector three wasn't great for him either, which is probably why he was so down on himself when he came in uh, at the end of that last lap, having got the pole and seemingly astonished on the radio that that terrible lap he had just driven had got him the pole. But the interesting point is that if you add up his first and third sectors from his first run in Q3 and then you insert what he did through the first Lesmo in, in between those two, that lap would have been a 19.232, so it definitely would have been the pole. As it was, as I say, he got the pole on his first run when Oscar Piastri did a 19.4 and Lando's in the 19.4s as well, but a little bit quicker. But he, he did it. I, I, and what it is now, it's about a driver, the purity of a driver, wanting to get as near as he can to the perfect lap in what quite patently is an almost perfect racing car right now in terms of the, the, the feel it's giving the drivers, in terms of the sweet spot it's giving the drivers and the engineers around which they can tune the car. And that's why Lando was saying, oh, I'm really sorry, guys, because he, he just felt he hadn't got the best from the car on that one lap and stitched it all together. But I say for what he did in sector two and how he found that time in sector two, that was where he deserved the pole, let alone anything else that's happened this weekend. Just a wonderful piece of driving and beautiful to watch. Uh, P3, George Russell, very good performance in George Russell in the Mercedes. Mercedes doesn't have quite the same sweet spot as the McLaren. That's why it's third. Uh, George, I say, an excellent performance because don't forget Friday, yesterday, FP1, his car was badly shunted by Kimi Antonelli. It has now been confirmed. Rather surprisingly, I suppose. No, I, I mean, Mercedes have got massive faith in this young Italian. His 
permanent seat in the team for 2025 has now been confirmed. But anyway, he damaged the car badly after 10 minutes of FP1, which meant that George uh, was late out in FP2, 20 minutes late out, didn't get a massive amount of data and confidence in the car in FP2, ran mediums and then one set of softs. And while we're on the subject, George, let's have a look at what he did in FP3 because now he put in the fuel run that he was unable to do in FP2. And the only other driver to put fuel in the car and do any sort of run this morning, oddly, I thought, was Max Verstappen, bearing in mind how on the edge Red Bull are in terms of trying to find a workable balance, a balance that will stick on the car from one session to the next in terms of different track temperature, ambient temperature, crosswind, whatever it may be. Uh, Red Bull, you would imagine, would just been working flat out on setup. But no, there was Max out there doing this long run this morning in FP3 on medium tyres. And not very impressive either. 25.8, 25.2, high 24s then, and then back to 25s. Look at George Russell, 25.8, 24.1, low 24s. And then he does a 23.4, 23.0. Now, it's possible, of course, that George wasn't running the same amount of fuel but look, they both started with a 25.8. So that suggests that maybe they were running the same amount of fuel. And Max, significantly, I think, talking after about five laps, I guess after he did that 24.8, that the left rear was going off. And they said, stay out there, do some more with the left rear going off. So that doesn't augur very well for Red Bull's performance in the race tomorrow either. So George Russell third, Ferrari fourth and fifth, with both drivers doing a very good job, Carlos Sainz, on occasion quicker than, than Charles. Charles just pipping him right at the end of qualifying. The problem on the Ferrari, they've taken the downforce out of the car like everybody, as everybody has around Monza. Uh, but they've lost more grip on the slow corners than say McLaren and Mercedes quite clearly. Can't include Red Bull in that anymore. And Ferrari relatively quick in a straight line, which means that they're not enjoying the turbulence generating downforce that, say, McLaren have. So let's just have a look then as we go through the grid at what the top speeds are, relative top speeds are, of all the drivers. You can see as a general pattern that anybody over 350 through the speed trap, which is just before the braking area of the first chicane, is not very quick around Monza. That suggests that the downforce they have on the car isn't generating too much drag and if it's not generating too much drag therefore it's not working very well so your, your yardstick obviously is Lando Norris 349 Oscar Piastri 348 and yet you've got say the the, the Sauber's doing 352 uh, and that's the difference for you one pole against the south pole uh, you can see how little downforce Sauber have for a high top speed I'm sure they would like to have a slower top speed and more downforce but of course if they do that then they're really going to be out of sync in terms of top speed so that's where they're at that's what we talk about when we when we say operating window and sweet spot really it's just that McLaren have so much room now to maneuver in terms of setting up the car Anyway, the McLaren's 348, 349. Mercedes, about the same, significantly. I, I wouldn't have said their way they can manage the tyres is quite as good as McLaren. That's partly on past experience, but also on comments coming from the drivers. Both drivers also complaining, certainly this morning, still about the heat in the cockpit from the seat. Doesn't look as if Mercedes had got on top of that problem, although there weren't any comments in the afternoon that I heard. So maybe they are on top, but certainly tomorrow that will be an issue if they're in the hot seat. Then the Ferraris, 350, 350, as I say, quite relatively quick in a straight line. Yeah, you could say, well, only one kilometre, but I'm sure Ferrari would rather be 347, 348 and have a little bit more downforce. And that's a lot of time you're sitting at that speed as well at Monza, because it's not only, yeah, they're not at that velocity on the run down to the Parabolica or the run out of the, the second Lesmo. It's an issue there for Ferrari that they can't get more downforce out of the car. And it explains why Charles was very disappointed after after qualifying because you just couldn't get the car to turn in on into the chicanes really that was his issue in the slow corners as with Carlos Sainz big moment for Carlos Sainz coming out of the second Lesmo on his first run in Q3 uh, a lot of drivers Oscar Piastri another Kevin Magnussen this morning a lot of drivers running wide coming out of the second Lesmo and uh, with oversteer and 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 it's and it's one of these and Max Max too did had a moment as well but with Carlos he had one of those and then the car snapped back onto the new surface, new track surface all around Monza this year. And that was the moment you thought, wow, the car control of these guys is just 
formidable because it's one thing to get the opposite lock on at exactly the right rate to go from tarmac to dirt and to know exactly how much opposite lock to put on just to control the slide but when the car comes back there's always a moment when you think ah is he going to hold it when mere mortals like you and i are going to get into one of these and carlos got it absolutely perfect and just kept it going lost the lap of course but spectacular piece of driving by carlos science i thought Lewis Hamilton, 19.5348, yeah, about the same as, as George there. Uh, disappointed. But then again, if he looks at those times, 19.5, look at that from Oscar Piastri down to Lewis Hamilton. You're talking about 0 0.077 of a second covers those five cars from Oscar to Lewis. So unbelievably close. Lewis, uh, like George, had a little bit of a toe at some moments. George from his mate Alex Albon, but both drivers actually did those quickest laps without a toe. In Lewis's case, actually, he had to pass Max going into the first chicane, and I wonder whether that slightly discombobulated him as he went into the braking area because he wasn't very good on sector one on his quickest lap. I say very good. He was just slightly off. He's normally absolutely brilliant there, and I think Max just being in sight there and having to go slightly offline to pass him there's no issue, but uh, I think that probably explains why Lewis wasn't up there right there with George. Max, as I say, 20.0. He did a 19.6 on, on scrubs soft tyres in Q2 at the end of the Q2 session just to try a different front flap angle. And the car was obviously quite good. So he came back into the garage and they felt right. 19.6 on scrub softs. That's what a 19.2, 19.3 on a new set of softs in Q3. Bring it on. And Max couldn't get under 120 in Q3 on either lap and just had no grip at all. And that is just a sign of putting more grip on the car and it immediately changes the balance front to rear, whether it be understeer or oversteer, totally unpredictable in what it's going to do. And that's just a sign of a tiny operating window and a, and a center of pressure that immediately moves under the car if you change the amount of grip on the front and rear axle. And that's what they're experiencing. That's what Mercedes and a lot of other teams, McLaren in 22, most of 23 as well, were experiencing and which they're getting through now. And ironic, is it not, that Red Bull seem to be going further and further into this dark hole of not understanding what's going on with the car. I said uh, in the live stream that knowing why you're quick is often a lot more difficult than knowing why you're slow. Because when you're slow, as Mercedes or McLaren have been in the last two and a half years, you've got yardsticks that you can build against and you continue to match yourself against those yardstick and those problems you have. But when Red Bull have been winning by impunity, they're not actually getting a massive amount of data or information that can help them in situations in which they find them today, find themselves today, because there's been no yardstick for it. And now all of a sudden the car isn't working. All I can say is to repeat the point that it looks to me, and not only me, but several other observers, that the Red Bull RB20 lost some pace and balance and some sweet spot, if you like, after the Chinese Grand Prix, between the Chinese Grand Prix and the Miami Grand Prix. Now, Red Bull will say not, but the FIA did reword a regulation about the cross-braking on the car, the use of cross-braking on the car, which is completely illegal. But if there was a valve that was being used by Red Bull and maybe by other teams, which was to the letter of the regulations legal, the clarification that was then issued in the August break rendered it illegal. And maybe there was a nod and a wink after China to say, take that off the car. Now, Red Bull is saying that's not the case, that they've had this inherent problem of how to manage the car front to rear balance wise from the start of the year. Well, let them say that. But from the start of the year, the car hasn't looked to be anything like as difficult to set up uh, in terms of changing conditions as it is today. Significantly also, Sergio Perez was actually very good at the beginning of Q3 on a scrub set of softs. Went slightly quicker than Max Verstappen. Drove really well. But then they put the new set, the one set they wanted him to run in Q3 because he'd overused the sets getting into Q3. And again, the car was all over the place. He had a massive moment at the Lismas and backed off and let Max through. Tried to get Max, help Max with the toe going to the Parabolica, but the gap was too big, didn't happen. And, and so we see Sergio Perez, 346 in a straight line, not very quick, and, not, and the Red Bulls in general, not very quick around corners either. So very difficult day for them tomorrow. I guess they're hoping magically that they'll have a balance and a grip and there'll be lots of 
dramas in the race and lots of opportunities to come in and change tires or whatever they think but if it's a normal monza race blink and you miss it super quick race with one pit stop very difficult to imagine how red bull can do anything from there really certainly not get near the podium so as i say you know in terms of the championship as i've been saying since hungary in terms of the championship becoming more and more in focus for lando norris and difficult to see how he's not going to have a great sunday tomorrow i suppose his nearest opposition is going to be oscar piastri but you've got to imagine that by now the penny will have dropped at mclaren that the best way of trying to win a driver's championship is to get Oscar now to support Lando Norris. I would imagine that's what they're thinking, but maybe not. Maybe they don't have to bring team orders into it because Oscar looked a little bit rough today. I say rough only in comparison with Lando Norris, who has this this wonderful ability, as I've been talking about from the start of the video, to be on neither the brakes nor the throttle, to let the car go in at much higher speed than it could take if you had load on the car, front or rear. And he, and he did that, and that's where he got that, that wonderful sector two in, in his last lap. But Oscar is either on the brakes or on the throttle compared with Lando. And it, I've been saying that he does seek shorter corners. He's, he's more interested in creating shorter corners than Lando Norris is. But at the same time, Lando definitely has the edge when it comes to touch and feel at the moment. And you can see things in Oscar's driving, particularly at, at Monza, actually, with less downforce on the car. He is quite aggressive, quite obviously, with the power, because there have been several occasions when Oscar's had one of these moments. And you haven't really seen Lando do that. You've seen Lando go straight on and do things that you do at Monza, at chicanes, but not aggressive, over-aggressive use of the throttle. So, yeah, Oscar was kind of in the news today as well, because there was a moment when... He was released from his uh, garage right in front of Max. And he got, I think he got quite a large fine for that. And there was also a weird moment in FP3 when he was catching Charles Leclerc going into the first chicane. Charles was sort of backing out of the lap at this point. And Charles, I, by his own admission, hadn't realized how quickly Oscar was catching him and obviously held Oscar up. And Oscar had to brake really hard uh, and lost the lap. Uh, and then was in front of Charles as they went through the second chicane and through the, the two Lesmos. As they came out of the second Lesmo, neither Charles nor Oscar were going that quickly, but Charles was behind and thinking about passing Oscar on the right. And simultaneously, Daniel Ricciardo was catching them both on a quick lap in the Visa Cash app. And Daniel went quite well. As you can see there, he qualified quite well. And, and he was going to pass Oscar on the left. So Oscar started to move right just as Charles was passing Oscar on the right. And, had, and, and Charles, at high speed, had to put two wheels on the dirt, on the straight, down to Ascari. Very spooky moment. Just a reminder, I guess, that we can have all this GPS, we can have all this radio stuff, and the drivers can be very disciplined about what they do with slower cars and impeding and so forth. And yet still, incidents can happen. You cannot predict everything that's going to happen in Formula One. And this was a particularly nasty moment, I thought, for Charles Leclerc. Uh, so Alex Albon, very good job in the Williams Mercedes again, 20.2 and then 348. Good to see Williams not that quick in a straight line finally, doing a sort of really healthy straight line speed, which means they've got some serious downforce on that car that's working very well. And if you look at Franco Colapinto, also did a good job. The new number two uh, for the rest of the year anyway, that's the car Carlos Sainz will be in next year. 348 as well, so underlining that... Williams have got some efficient downforce in that car now, and it's showing up well in low downforce trim around Monza. Nico Hülkenberg, also great job for Haas Ferrari. He's got less downforce. You can see there how quick he is on the straight. That won't hurt him tomorrow in the race, although with less downforce, how he looks after the tyres with a full load of fuel might be more difficult for him. Fernando Alonso, similarly in the Aston Martin, very quick in a straight line, uh, unhealthily quick in a straight line, given how relatively slow Fernando is on the lap, 20.4. You'd expect more from Fernando in the Aston Martin, Lance Stroll, 21.0. This is a guy that was on, I think it was on the front row once around Monza, wasn't he? 21.0 and then 3.51, so also very quick in a straight line, just showing that they don't have much usable downforce that's inevitably going to generate uh, turbulence and and they and they're too quick in a straight line. Aston Martin, Daniel Ricciardo, as I say, pretty good in the Visa Cash app. Uh, Yuki Tsunoda, very annoyed, and cursing and swearing after Q1. Not quite sure whether it was traffic or just generally not be, because he hadn't been very good. Um, he was good. I saw him win. I think he won an F3 race here once um, at Monza. But uh, anyway, terrible 
performance from Yuki. Uh, see whether he can get into the points and where he is tomorrow. Kevin Magnussen in the other Haas Ferrari. Very messy FP3 off at the Parabolica, off at the Lesmos. Uh, but yeah, you know, there or thereabouts. Again, 3.51 compared with Nico Hulkenberg. Virtually the same time as Nico. So, well, no, three tenths slower, sorry, than Nico. And um, yeah, looking like a driver who's going into his last few races, I guess. The two Alpines, again, too much top speed, not enough downforce. Pierre Gasly just ahead of Esteban Ocon and uh, Lance Stroll. And then finally at the back, the two Saubers, again, 352, which you don't need around Monza. You'd want to be 348, 347. Thank you very much. The only other critical point, <laughs> he says with a laugh, I would report from Saturday is my bet noir. The, the drivers who don't stay as close to the white line as they can on acceleration out of the Ascari chicane on the rundown of the Parabolica. When mathematics and science tells you that the longer you stay, keep the car in a straight line while you're accelerating six, seventh, eighth gear, the less drag, less G-force effect you're going to have through the engine, less revs you're going to drop. If you leave the moment when you move to the left of the track to the last possible comfortable moment, you're doing it when the downside is least. If you start moving the car to the left, as soon as you've left the Ascari chicane, you're putting that G-force. And there is G-force that goes through the engine as you move the car flat out on the straight from one side of the straight to the other side of the straight. You're allowing that G-force then to hurt the engine while it's still accelerating. And that has more impact. You'll lose more revs. Just think about if you're doing a standing start against a stopwatch and you miss first to second gear, that will impact the acceleration run much more than if you miss fourth to fifth gear near the end of the run. It just stands to reason. Uh, so my bet noir is the drivers who don't do that, or the drivers, I think, should get a massive thumbs up if they've done it well. The annoying thing, of course, is that we don't see every driver on every run down to the Parabolica when they're not in traffic. If you're in traffic, of course, all bets are off and you just have to follow the car because that's where the toe is. But uh, if you're on free road, the drivers that I saw that tick the box of staying absolutely on the right today and yesterday were George Russell, Alex Albon, Fernando Alonso and Nico Hülkenberg. Full marks to them. Astonishingly, and I'm absolutely amazed. I think Lewis was doing it as well, I've got to say. I never really saw it that clear. I just saw him in the background doing it, but then the camera cut away. But astonishingly, the driver who wasn't doing it on his own was Max Verstappen. He was coming out of Ascari and then sort of hitting the white line on exit and then just immediately going over to the left side of the road. Now, I don't know whether this is angry Max, who just, you know, he's fed up with the corners, just wants to get the car in a straight line and not thinking about things that much. Or whether, I mean, potentially... Because Max is, that is as good as he is. But I've got to say, Charles Leclerc is another driver that was doing it very well down the inside. I don't know why I haven't mentioned him before. Yes, yeah, Charles Leclerc was also doing a great job down there. Uh, but potentially, maybe with the resurfacing, there's more bumps or something on that section of road and Max is just feeling it's better on the left. But if it isn't that, then he's missing a trick there because there's certainly revs that he would have lost. Not that it would have made any difference to where the Red Bull was today in terms of lap time. I mean, bear in mind, he was the only driver today that did not go quicker in Q3. Every other top driver went faster. 0.4 in the case of the two McLarens, 0.4 in the case of George Russell from Q2 to Q3, Carlos Sainz 0.3, Charles Leclerc found over half a second, 0.6. And Lewis Hamilton found one-tenth. Didn't have a great lap. Wouldn't have been that happy with his Q3. Max Verstappen, by contrast, lost 0.3 in Q3. Went backwards to the tune of three-tenths of a second on both his runs, which just shows the trouble that Red Bull are in. And they have no idea what they're doing with the car at the moment and how to react, how to predict what the car's going to do when you put on a new set of tyres. Completely lost by that. And just to finish that, Perez went 0.2 quicker from Q2 to Q3. Alex Albon found a tenth of a second and Nika Hulkberg found a tenth of a second. And then he had one run uh, because they didn't have enough tyres, of course. So um, for Max Verstappen to lose three tenths in Q3, to be relatively slow on fuel in FP3, to be starting seventh, this has got to be... So far, the worst weekend he's had in, well, I don't know how many years. Uh, anyway, we'll see tomorrow how it goes for him. Damage limitation, very good in Zandvoort, the Dutch Grand Prix. Still finished second ahead of Oscar Piastri in the Ferraris. 
but it's going to be very difficult for him to do that tomorrow. Very, very difficult even to make the podium tomorrow for Max Verstappen. Meanwhile, at the front of the grid, all orange. Lando Norris, absolutely in the class of his own, the way he drove that car and what he did with that car. And I'm beginning to really, really love the way that Lando is so self-deprecating. Just brilliant. Because that adds up, ultimately, to being self-critical. And that's what it's all about. So congratulations to Lando on that absolutely superb, well, superb pole lap. But I was actually better than that superb, approach to the first Lesmo. That'll not be quickly forgotten. Big thanks to Jetcraft, to OEM Exclusive and to Track Ninja. Big thanks to you too, the viewer. See you tomorrow.